Our sermon text this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 16, starting at verse 4b, the second part of that verse, through verse 11. If you're following along in the few Bibles, it's on page 104 in the New Testament section. I did not say these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because they do not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer. About judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. Heavenly Father, again as we open your word this morning, we invite your spirit to come and be our interpreter. That we may be strengthened by your word and encourage one another in it. And ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, you know, there are a lot of critical questions in life, a lot of important questions in life that don't get asked often enough. For example, why are there interstate highways in Hawaii? Why does sour cream have an expiration date? How, how could fat chance and slim chance mean the same thing? And why is the word little twice as big as the word big? And how could there possibly be jumbo shrimp? These are the puzzles of life. And we need to ask these questions more. And Jesus was puzzled by the question that was left unasked by his disciples in this passage. Now the sea is the Last Supper. Jesus is spending this last time with his disciples, and in these chapters, John 14 through 17, he's talking with his disciples and he's praying for them, and he's telling them that he has to leave. He's telling them that he's going to be leaving them, but he says here, you know, nobody's asked me, where are you going? And nobody asked the question because Jesus said their hearts were full of sorrow, their hearts were heavy with grief because they heard that he was leaving them, and they didn't understand this. And because it it crushed their dreams of, of what they had envisioned of going into Jerusalem and Jesus kicking out the Romans and establishing the, the nation of Israel once again and them, and them in prime positions of power. All their visions and hopes and dreams for why they were following Jesus seemed to be evaporating. And none of them asked, where are you going? It was a critical question because to ask where Jesus was going then naturally would lead to the question as to why he is leaving. Where Jesus is going is that he is returning to his Father. And he said, this isn't a bad thing, it's a good thing. You know, I'm not abandoning you, I'm not, I'm not leaving the mission. This all hasn't been in vain, I'm leaving because... When I go back to the Father, I will send the Holy Spirit to be with you. I will send, as it says, the Advocate. Some translations might say Counselor, some might say Helper. It's all in that same line, except it, it's the idea of, a, of a, someone, of an Advocate in a courtroom, of a Counselor in a courtroom, who is coming to stand for our defense, who is coming to, to stand beside us. And Jesus is explaining to us here that the reason that the Holy Spirit is going to come is because he is going to show the world that they were wrong about three things. That the world was wrong about sin, about righteousness, and about judgment. And Jesus is defining the world in this passage as those who do not believe in him. The spiritual forces of evil that are behind that. Those also who have refused to believe in him. You see, the world called Jesus a sinner.
because he committed the sin of blasphemy. He claimed to be king of the Jews. He claimed to be equal with God. And so as a result, he was declared to be unrighteous. Uh, the, the Jews handed him over to the Romans. And Pilate pronounced a death sentence on him. And he received the condemnation they thought for that sin. And he died the death that only the people who committed the most heinous crimes died. Death of crucifixion. And so to the world, the cross was proof of Jesus' sin, of his unrighteousness, and his condemnation. However, the coming of the Holy Spirit proves that Jesus is the King of the Jews. Because the Holy Spirit can only come if Jesus has ascended to his throne. If Jesus is seated with the Father in heaven. And so the presence of the Holy Spirit signifies the truth that Jesus has been received by his Father into the kingdom. And has his proper position on the throne. And that his claim to be the king of the Jews was true. It wasn't blasphemy because it was true. As a result, he is declared righteous by the Father, having fulfilled all the righteous requirements of the law. And so it is not Jesus who stands condemned, it is Jesus who is glorified. And the condemnation and the judgment is upon, as Jesus says in his passage, the prince of this world. It was referring to as Satan. And Satan has condemned, not Jesus. It is Satan who has proved to be a liar. It is Satan who is working to oppose God and God's commands. And now, because Jesus has ascended to the throne, and now because the Holy Spirit has come, we have a new understanding of sin and righteousness. Before Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, sin was understood as uh, breaking God's commands, breaking God's laws. The sins that we commit, those sins that we commit that bar us from entering the kingdom of heaven. But now, in Jesus' words here in John chapter 16, sin is being connected with a failure to believe in Christ. That is the sin that keeps us from the kingdom of heaven. It isn't our sins that keep us from the kingdom of heaven because Jesus died for those sins. It is the sin of unbelief. It is the sin of not putting our faith in Jesus Christ. Notice that word, that sin, as Jesus talks about sin, he talks about it as singular, a sin, which reminds us back in John chapter 6. Where Jesus is talking to a group of people and they ask him, what are the works, plural, the works that we must do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds by saying the work, singular, the work is to believe in the one that God has sent. The work is singular just as the sin is singular. The work is to believe in Jesus, the sin is to not believe in Jesus. And righteousness is no longer about the works that we try to do to earn that status and to earn that position. Because we can never do enough good things to, to wipe out the punishment for our sin, which is death. You know, we used to think of, you know, people often talk about, well, when I get to the pearly gates, you know, Hopefully I'll have more good check marks in the column and I'll have bad check marks in the column. That's not what righteousness is about. Righteousness is about Jesus' righteousness that he achieved, that he earned through his ministry and his death on the cross. That now is applied to us through the Holy Spirit. That when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live in us. That cleanses us from our sin and that begins that process of transforming our lives to reflect the image of God. So righteousness isn't about now what we earn. It's about what 
God has already earned for us. That we are declared righteousness not by our own deeds, but by the work of Jesus Christ. So sin and righteousness are no longer words that have to burden us. No longer words that have to weigh us down. No longer words that make it seem like it's impossible to know God or to get to God. And that's why this passage is so important. Because so many of us, I think, still carry with us those images of God as that uh, you know, gray-bearded old guy you know, sitting up top somewhere looking at us and ready to zap us when we do something wrong. You know, there are a lot of people that still carry that image of God. There are still a lot of people that think that sin and righteousness have to do with their works. Even a lot of people in the church. Jesus is freeing us from that understanding. That's not the reality that we live in because of his work and the coming of the Holy Spirit. All we need to do is to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died for our sins, and that he rose again, that we might be forgiven of our sins, and that we might be followers of him. And that his righteousness is applied to us. And that's what makes us worthy of entering the kingdom of heaven. Nothing that we have done nothing that we have earned. It's what Jesus has given us. The prince of this world stands condemned. Now hold up. How does the Holy Spirit do this? How does the Holy Spirit convict the world of these things? It is by being alive in us. It is by being present in us. pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the apostles on that day of Pentecost and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives today is proof that Jesus is alive, that he's on the throne, that he's seated with the Father. Which condemns the world for their unbelief, their refusal to accept God's gift of salvation. The denial of the reality of the person and work of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has proven the case. This is the last piece <coughs> of God's salvation plan. And through the Holy Spirit, that case is closed. Jesus has won the victory. God's salvation plan is complete. We can be free from the burden of sin and death through our faith in Jesus Christ. And all we need to do is to believe. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words of Jesus in John 16, which were proven in Acts chapter 2, which became a reality in Acts chapter 2, which is the proof of Jesus' sinlessness, of his righteousness, and of his glorification. And through the Holy Spirit, we know that Jesus is alive. Through the Holy Spirit, we know that our sins have been forgiven. Through the Holy Spirit, we know we have a future with you. So we thank you, Lord. We thank you for these words. I pray, Lord, that all of us receive that gift and know what it means to receive that gift, know what it means to give our lives to you, to trust you with everything in our lives. To stop the struggle of trying to earn our righteousness. To stop the struggle of trying to be good enough to enter the kingdom of heaven. 
and instead to be transformed by your spirit working in our hearts. That the fruit of that spirit comes forth and is a testimony to the world around us. The love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That mark a believer in Jesus Christ. that this is all through faith. Through faith by your grace. Your grace which we testify to in the sacrament of baptism this morning. And that we hear in the reading of your word. And in the proclaiming of your word. And Lord, we give you thanks and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Today, I admittedly, I'm stretching Charlotte this morning, <laughs> but she's up for it. <laughs> A little spiritual today for our last hymn, number 404.